This past January, I had the opportunity to participate in a panel at the annual conference for the Co Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, or CCCU as it is known. It was an interfaith panel featuring presidents of universities from different religious faiths. In addition to me, panelists included Ari Berman, president of Yeshiva University, a Jewish university in New York City, Father John Fitzgibbons from Regis University, a Jesuit Catholic university in Denver, Colorado, Hamza Youssef, president of Zaytuna College in Berkeley, California, the only accredited Muslim institution of higher education in the United States, and Shirley Mullen, the president of Houghton College, a Christian liberal arts college in upstate New York. It was a wonderful opportunity to talk about the challenges and benefits of religiously affiliated universities. Some important truths were shared, including the observation that the very existence of this diverse panel demonstrated that people who disagree about, about important issues, even issues that are of the most profound significance to them, like religious beliefs and who is God, these people can still interact, converse, and cooperate to achieve their distinctive goals. And they can do so without either compromising their core beliefs or requiring that others agree with their views on those core beliefs. I hope we can share and model that important truth with our students and others with whom we come in contact, both on and off campus. In the highly polarized environment in which we live, where the ability to address and resolve difficult issues sometimes seems in short supply, we at Brigham Young University should be examples of civility, respect, and optimism. Panel members presented some very interesting and innovative ideas about how to achieve their distinctive faith-based missions. One idea in particular caught my attention. The moderator asked President Yusuf to identify the biggest challenge facing his university, this Muslim university in Berkeley, California. President Yusuf said, the biggest problem we have and the biggest challenge we have are the costs to our students and the financing of their education. At that point, the question turned to President Berman from Yeshiva. I want you to listen to and watch his response. President uh, Berman, how about you, the um, greatest threat to the education mission? And, and so how let, let me just start off with costs for a second, uh, which is not insignificant. Um, I, uh, uh, this concept of uh, meeting with and speaking with presidents of faith-based universities is something that I thought uh, would be very important to me. And in my first year as president, I've been uh, Yeshiva University's president for a year and a half. I visited a number of different presidents from faith-based universities, including a trip to Salt Lake City where I visited Kevin. And I was told that BYU's education, I think it cost $5,000? Tuition. Tuition is $5,000. OK, this is a, a top line education visit, $5,000. I asked Kevin. How is it only $5,000? <laughs> and he told me that everyone uh, in the church tithes, and it goes to a central bank, and they subsidize the education, which then uh, made me realize that I had a genius idea. We're going to make Yeshiva University a new branch of the Church of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm still, I'm still speaking to my trustees about this. I think he but is too. I, I haven't I'm mentioned it to mine yet. Yes. So. <laughs> I will confess I still haven't formally presented the idea of a BYU New York to our board of trustees. But President Berman is not alone in recognizing the incredible value that Brigham Young University provides to its students. In April of this year, Forbes magazine issued a ranking of what it called the best value colleges in 2019. You will notice that number one, located on your left, is BYU, just ahead of Princeton. The rankings were based on the quality of the university, the net cost of the university, the net debt of the students coming out of the university, the average mid-career earnings of graduates, the graduation rate, and also access for low-income students. Using those metrics, Brigham Young University is the best value college in the United States. Now, I understand that these, there are other metrics that might be used and that there is some subjectivity even in these metrics. But you don't have to look very far across campus to see a number of accomplishments and recognition that provide evidence of the remarkable value we provide to our students. 
In February, College Magazine, which is primarily catered to and written by students, ranked the various advertising programs in the nation. Again, BYU is number one. The accompanying write-up discusses the kind of research that goes on in that program, as well as the experiential learning opportunities it provides and concludes, quote, the BYU students learn in such a way that they are ready to be involved in the industry right from the beginning. Another example. In January of this year, the Chronicle of Higher Education published an article on foreign language programs in the United States and ranked them according to the number of foreign language degrees conferred. BYU is number three. BYU is the only private school in the top 10. And as you can see, BYU produces more graduates in Russian, Arabic, and Portuguese than any other university. Had the researchers gone on to consider not just the number of students graduating with a foreign language degree, but also the number of students who took a foreign language class and the number of languages in which classes are offered, BYU would have clearly been number one. The examples could go on and on, and you saw some of them in the presentation as we were coming in today. In literally every college on campus, students, faculty, and staff are regularly exemplifying excellence in education, providing additional evidence of the extraordinary value of a BYU education. But these examples do not come close to capturing or portraying the real value, the long-lasting value of a BYU education. The real value that BYU has to offer its students is sometimes hard to quantify or even fully describe, but some get close to the matter. In 2016, the keynote speaker at the annual conference of the Council for Co Christian Colleges and Universities was David Brooks. Brooks is a New York Times columnist who was raised as in a secular Jewish home and who has taught for several years at Yale University. He comes from a world that is in many ways far removed from that found on the campuses of most CCCU members. Perhaps because of this different perspective, Brooks shed light on the often unrecognized value of the kind of faith-based education that CCCU schools and BYU can provide. Brooks stated, you have what everybody else is desperate to have, a way of talking about and educating the human person in a way that integrates faith, emotion, and intellect. You have a recipe to nurture human beings who have a devoted heart, a courageous mind, and a purposeful soul. Almost no other set of institution in American society has that, and everyone wants it. From my point of view, you're ahead of everybody else and have the potential to influence American culture in a way that could be magnificent. Let me elaborate a bit on two points Brooks made, points that shed light on the real value of a BYU education. First, notice that Brooks states that faith-based colleges like BYU have a way of talking about and educating the human person in a way that integrates faith, emotion, and intellect a recipe to nurture human beings who have a devoted heart, a courageous mind, and a purposeful soul. This statement fairly describes one part of the real value of a BYU education. It is an education that engages and improves the whole person. Brooks could just as well have cited the aims of a BYU education in describing the kind of distinctive education that faith-based universities can provide. A BYU education is to be spiritually strengthening, intellectually enlarging, character building, leading to lifelong learning and service. A BYU education does not focus solely on the acquisition of knowledge, as important as that is. As our mission statement makes clear, a BYU education focuses on the full realization of human potential. And modern-day prophets who direct this university have emphasized that that potential is much greater than most people understand. All our students, indeed all human beings, are beloved spirits, sons and daughters of heavenly parents, and as, as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. If we can help our students understand and act on the deep truths in that simple sentence, it will transform and increase the value of their BYU education in ways that no earthly ranking system can measure. It will give them confidence to do hard things. It will cause them to love all whom they encounter even those who are different from them or who dogmatically disagree with them. It will enable them to be community builders and national leaders. Understanding those truths, where, which are at the foundation of God's plan of happiness for His children, will help them realize not only who they really are, but what they can become in this life and the next. 
But that remarkable kind of education, which according to Brooks, everybody is desperate to have, will happen only if we are willing to fully engage in the unique kind of conversations that can happen only at a place like BYU. Only if, to use Brooks' language, we talk about and educate the human person in a way that integrates faith, emotion, and intellect. If we don't do that, we will be just like other universities, good, maybe even great in some respects, but we will not be providing the full value we are uniquely qualified to provide. For example, if we don't keep our subject matter bathed in the light and color of the restored gospel, as President Kimball implored us to do, we will miss our unique opportunity to nurture human beings who have a devoted heart, a courageous mind, and a purposeful soul. So I challenge each of us to be more diligent in considering how the truths of the plan of happiness can be modeled, taught, and expressly discussed to a greater degree, not only in our classrooms, but also in every situation in which we encounter students. This challenge extends beyond the faculty to everyone who interacts with students, no matter the particular responsibility. This example that I'll show you from Dining Services shows what can happen when we focus on students and not just on the task at hand. All right, so picture this. Every Monday through Saturday, every week, we're moving about 140,000 gallons of milk, over 5,000 half gallons of ice cream ingredients for about 13,000 mint brownies, and food for over 180,000 meals, all before BYU wakes up. I haven't slept in two years. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. Thousands of students working around the clock every day to feed the campus. And it's more than just making a lot of food. The meals are made with the person in mind. The day-to-day -day here is a huge undertaking. Dining Services does everything food for BYU. We're in charge of providing food for over 40,000 hungry students, faculty, and members of the community every day. People call me Chef John. I'm the executive chef for BYU Dining. I supervise all BYU chefs, and I'm in charge of planning every dish and meal that goes through BYU Dining. And I wouldn't be able to do any of it without our student employees. BYU Dining has over 2,000 student employees. Our workforce represents students from 158 different majors, coming from 37 countries and all 50 states. That makes us both the largest and most diverse student dining workforce in the world, and our jobs are just as varied. So I work with the Culinary Support Center delivery team as a driver and puller, which means I pretty much organize the food and deliver it all over campus. I'm Claudia, and I supervise 15 retailers in the world, as well as the Blue Line Deli and the Museum of Art Cafe, and I'm a full-time student. It's crazy, but I get tons of experience and love the people I work with. Most universities wouldn't imagine having their students take on the jobs that we have ours do, especially such a large scale. But with the leadership of our full-time staff, they get it all done. So we do everything from menu planning, food preparation, retail dining, delivery, receiving, event logistics, accounting, budgeting, dietetics, and nutrition planning. We form a pretty good team. Simply put, BYU Dining is chef-driven and student-powered. It's important to keep in mind that what we do here is about more than just the food. One of my favorite things about working here at BYU is a special spirit that lifts me up at work, and I wouldn't have that experience working anywhere else. It's taught me to take initiative in my work and everything I do, and it really teaches us self-reliance, which is kind of preparing us for our future. So really what we do every day is somewhat of a miracle. We feed tens of thousands and nourish the one. I love the line, when we feed, we feed tens of thousands and nourish the one. When we really believe that our students, our sons and daughters of heavenly parents, with a divine nature and destiny, we trust them to do things that others would think beyond the capacity of young, inexperienced college students, things that our students themselves may think they cannot do, both inside and outside the classroom. That, in turn, inspires them and causes them to feel differently about their work and about themselves. It also helps them to develop Christ-like characteristics. This doesn't require that we have scripture study before every class or work assignment, though such references are always in order, but it does require that we continually focus on student development and that we be purposeful in helping students see how the truths of the restored gospel can influence all we do even preparing and delivering meals. 
That is the kind of education that integrates faith, emotion, and intellect, and nurtures human beings who have a devoted heart, a courageous mind, and a purposeful soul. That is real value added. The second thing that I wish to emphasize from Brooks' observation concerns the impact that this holistic educational effort can have on the world. Speaking of the kind of whole soul education that places like BYU can provide, Brooks said, almost no other set of institutions has that, and everyone wants it. Because of that, he said, we have the potential to influence American culture in a way that could be magnificent. If we provide an education that engages the full intellectual and spiritual capacities of our students, we will not only help them improve their individual lives, we will equip them to make a profound difference in the world around them. They will be capable of addressing the world's problems, great and small, and they will have a deep-seated desire to do so as they come to understand that those around them are also sons and daughters of God. That is something that the world not only wants, but desperately needs. The world needs solutions to a lot of problems, and individuals in the world hunger for the soul-filling joy that comes from solving those problems through selfless service. And we can help them see, find examples of both of these in the education we provide our students. This past year, a group of engineering students were asked to come up with a solution to a serious air pollution problem in Mongolia. In 2016, there were over 3,000 deaths in Mongolia attributable to air pollution-caused diseases. The majority of victims were children under the age of five. One of the principal sources of the pollution is the tons of coal that Mongolians burn each year to heat their traditional homes, known as gares or yurts. Being given that assignment to solve that problem, here is what happened to these BYU students as a result. When we began this project, we didn't expect to go see the Mongolian countryside, to be on national television, to be taking Mongolian lessons from 10-year-olds, to meet the prime minister, to be so cold. <laughs> we didn't expect that we would be making friends halfway across the world. Ulaanbaatar is the coldest capital in the whole world. One of the biggest problems in Ulaanbaatar is the air pollution. Most of the pollution in the winter comes from the Ger districts. Ger is a Mongolian word for yurt, which is their traditional tent. Coal stoves are some of the only sources of heat that these people have in the winter. Everyone's breathing this smoke-filled air. As we started to look at that problem, we thought maybe we can do something about it. So we approached BYU capstone team and said, here's the problem, can you solve it? There are two teams here in Capstone that were trying to solve the same problem. And the solution that we landed on was a, an electric heater that would replace the coal burning stove. With the current insulation they have, the felt, it would take about six electric heaters to produce enough heat to keep that warm constantly. As we improve the insulation, they'll be able to use electricity more for their heating, less coal and less pollution. It wasn't until we landed in Mongolia and Ulaanbaatar that we actually understood the scope of our project. Because the coal stove is in the center of the home, a lot of those pollutants don't go up the chimney, they stay within the home. The World Health Organization standard for PM2.5, or particulate matter, is 25 micrograms per cubic meter. The concentration that we measured was over 400 inside the homes of these families. One team's approach was to insulate the current gear so that we could replace the coal stove with an electric heater. And then we cover the outside of the gear in a radiant barrier. And what that does is it reflects back the radiative heat that would otherwise be lost. It only works if there is a gap of air in between. And so we also use this foam to uh, put here to make that gap and that allows it to reflect back in. The students realize that this is real. Seeing how the design decisions you made thousands of miles away are actually being implemented in the field. After we finished our first retrofit, we came back the next morning to test the results. Walking in, we immediately felt a wave of heat hit us, but we were able to read the data. And we saw that while it dips outside below seven degrees Fahrenheit, inside it stayed at a constant 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So you'll save more money every year from now on. <laughs> it worked, and I kind of teared up a little bit. It was, it was really a miracle. They were so excited that this thing we'd been working on so hard actually worked. We have a real solution. We've proven that we can modify gear and heat it for about $400. 
But the next step now is to fully test that solution and we'll do that with 100, 120 modified gears this summer in preparation for winter testing. I hope that we not only see the world as our campus, but we start to see the world's problems as our problems. Every family we convince, we immediately impact their lives for good. We immediately influence their health and improve their quality of life. And so it's enough if one family adopts this to expand to tens of thousands of homes retrofitted is the dream. The last line of our mission statement proclaims our firm belief that the earnest pursuit of this institutional mission will greatly enlarge Brigham Young University's influence in a world we wish to improve. I offer this as Exhibit A of the fulfillment of that, what I think is a prophecy. As of the first of this month, Deseret International Charities was ready to launch phase two of the project with the expectation that they would insulate about 130 gears and build 10 alternative structures in the next four weeks. And there are discussions about the potential of five to 10,000 gears in 2020. But saving and improving the lives of thousands, as important and impactful as that accomplishment is, does not capture the full value of the experience. Our ultimate measure of success is the impact on our students, on what happens to them as a result of their time at BYU. Professor Brian Maceo, one of the faculty members working with the group in Mongolia, describes what can and will happen as we combine faith and study in the unique BYU learning process. The students both need to get inspiration as they are actually trying to execute a project like this. They, there's no way that they have all the information and so they have to seek inspiration from the Lord. There's no other way. Um, at the same time, I believe that they're trying to inspire others to be able to take solutions out into the world. And in particular here, it's to inspire others to be able to actually use the designs that they have created. So I see that as uh, kind of a twofold process of both receiving inspiration and inspiring others. And in the process, they are learning so many skills and methods and processes that allow them to be just more effective people, uh, not just engineers, but just more effective as people, as citizens of the world in all that they do. That is what inspiring learning looks like. And the students involved in the project in Mongolia experienced it. One student, Prabhaka Ramaraj, stated, quote, when, when you hit a roadblock and don't know what to do, there are a few things you rely on. For a BYU student, those things are knowledge, wisdom, and the spiritual aspect of prayer trying to receive revelation. On this project, he said, I have been able to experience those things. We have definitely been inspired, close quote. Another student, Austin Boyce, reported spending several sleepless nights in the Crabtree building trying to figure out how to build an exterior door that would be both energy efficient and fit into the nonagon structure of a gear. In facing those and other problems, he stated, quote, we as a team just had a lot of faith, to be honest. And we had the whole service center there in Mongolia fasting and praying for us as a team. It was pretty amazing, he continued, to have everything come together. Our biggest surprise was the impact that we had. It's something we hadn't even imagined because we were just some BYU students trying to fix a problem, close quote. Just some BYU students trying to fix a problem. Yet in doing that in the BYU way, they blessed the lives of thousands and changed their own lives and increased their own capacities to serve forever. Our mission statement indicates that our graduates are to be broadly prepared individuals who will not only be capable of meeting personal challenge and change, but will also bring strength to others in the tasks of home and family life, social relationships, civic duty, and service to mankind. We do not provide an education at BYU solely to prepare students for their first job, although we are interested in that. We do not provide an education to prepare them for their last job, although we are interested in that as well. In the end, we are not preparing students for jobs. 
we are preparing them for their eternal destiny as sons and daughters of heavenly parents. Our mission is to assist them in their quest for perfection and eternal life. That is real value, and it is a value beyond price. At the April 2018 commencement ceremony, Elder Holland, in his inimitable, articulate way, described for our students a vision of what they can become and the kind of magnificent impact they can have as a result of the education they receive here at BYU. You leave BYU to enter a political, social, and economic world your parents never knew and your grandparents could never have dreamed of. Perhaps that's true of each succeeding generation in history. But in my old age, I could, for one, not have imagined as a BYU student more than half a century ago the world you now go forth to experience. So much of that world is stunningly beautiful and rewarding. I do not agree that the best lack all conviction because you seated before me and a host of good people across the earth like you prove otherwise. I believe you to be the very best and I'm counting on you to be consumed with conviction. So go out there and light a candle. Be a ray of light. Be your best self and let your character shine. Cherish the gospel of Jesus Christ and live it. The world needs you and surely your Father in heaven needs you if his blessed purposes for his children are to prevail. You have entered to learn. Now go forth to serve and strengthen. If correcting all the world's ills seems a daunting task, so be it. Go out there and be undaunted. If we cannot look to you to change the world, tell me to whom we should look. Congratulations on your very significant achievement. May the sun always be at full noon for you banishing every shadow that might otherwise mar your happiness. I express our pride in you and wish you Godspeed for the exciting journey you now undertake. That is the best value in higher education today. It is a holistic education that is grounded in classrooms where true principles are taught and the Holy Ghost is present, where the joy of learning is palpable. It's an education where that same kind of joyful learning extends beyond the classroom to student-centered research, informal conversations, and student employment. It is, as President Kimball stated, an education for eternity. So as our conference theme encourages us to do, let us cheerfully do all things that lie in our power to provide that kind of education. Then, as that scripture promises, we can stand still with the utmost assurance to see the salvation of God and for his arm to be revealed. I bear you my witness that this university is part of the rolling forth of the kingdom of God on the earth. We, through our students, can have a magnificent impact on the world around us. That is our mission and our destiny if we work toward it. I'm grateful to each of you for what you do for who you are, and for the impact you have on our remarkable students. I urge you to do a little more, to be a little better, with a promise that your lives and the lives of so many others will be richer and more joyful as a result. And I bear you that witness in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.